by Ashley, director of Mounds County EMA, and Chris Strong is going to introduce him. Hello everyone. We have a great speaker today, Ashley Ty. No pressure. Worked with Ashley for many, many years. Fire Department at the EMA Director of Mounds County. He's here to tell us about hurricane preparedness and things that uh, we all need to be thinking about for our local government. So, Ashley? Thank you, Chris. As Chris said, I am the Emergency Management Director for Lowndes County. Been in that role for 10 years now. Um, also currently serving as the interim uh, fire chief for Lowndes County. And just to kind of give you a history of my background, before I was a, the EMA director, I worked for about eight years uh, with the City of Alaska Fire Department. So I kind of have uh, a long history in, in public safety. And very privileged to be able to come and share a few things with y'all today. First question for everybody, who, who in here knows who your EMA director in your county is? Let me see your hand. That's better than I expected. So for those of you that did not raise your hand, that is your homework, is to go back and, and figure out who your EMA director is, because every county uh, does have their own EMA director. And I will say, Mr. Sam, you've got a great one. I think the world of Mark is a good guy, so I just want to plug that in for him. When he comes asking for a raise, then you remember that. So when we talk about emergency management, um, we kind of break emergency management up and preparedness up into one of four phases. And a lot of times, several of those are going on at the same time. So the four phases of emergency management are mitigation, uh, preparedness, response, and recovery. So what I'm going to do is just take a few minutes and talk to you about what each one of those phases are and some of the things that we do, um, you as, as you know, in your county, uh, county level needs to be doing, but also just the personal level, some things. Um, you know, that's one of the things we encourage. The more personal preparedness we take, and the less we as um, government and public safety, that makes our job easier because that's less that we have to respond to and take care of. So when we talk about mitigation, the term hazard mitigation describes actions that can help reduce or eliminate long-term risks caused by natural hazards or disaster. That is the textbook definition. Basically, mitigation, um, and, and arguably, is maybe the most important because mitigation is basically just taking things to hopefully eliminate the, the disaster. But there are some things that we can't keep them from happening. Um, but if that, when they do happen, we want to make the impacts as, as little as possible. And so, some examples of some things, you know, installing backup generators. <clears throat> we can do the best we can, you know, Georgia Power goes around, cuts trees off the right of way and that kind of thing, but it's inevitable um, when we have storms come through, some of us are gonna lose power. So we can't, we, that's something we can't eliminate. <clears throat> but, you know, if, you, um, if you're a hospital, you know, some of our county buildings, you know, you got your server um, you know, with all of your network stuff housed in, in a certain building. There are certain places that when the power go, when the power goes out of my house, it's an aggravation. If the power goes out at the emergency operations center, or if it goes out at the fire station and the electric doors won't go up so the fireman can't respond to a call, that's, that's, a, that's a big problem. So some of the things we need to mitigate that is have backup generators. So when the power does go off, we've got backup to control some, you know, take care of some of those critical functions. Um, one of the things that, that um, we've been working on in Lyons, kind of the I-75 corridor with Lacucci Basin, is developing interactive flood models. Um, we work with, um, and it's been a long process. It, it started back in the, the floods of 2009, that some of y'all may remember. Um, we worked with Army Corps of Engineers, USGS, a lot of different people, and um, you know we've been able to, to gather the information. And hopefully, in the next six months or so, we're actually going to be able to roll out a um, flood model that the next time we have a flood event and the forecast comes out, 
people will be able to look and see um, what areas will be in fact impacted and how bad. Again, that's not going to keep anything from flooding. Flooding, but if you know, okay, the, the weather service forecast that the river is going to get to 15 feet. <coughs> well, when you look at this flood model, if your house is in an area that's going to get flooded at 15 feet, then that gives you time to move a lot of your stuff out and take some protective action. You can't move your house, but at least your personal belongings and that kind of thing, but you can. You know, that's going to lessen the impact of, of the flood for you. Um, provide a public warning systems, you know, for, for anything. Just letting people know that, um, that the disaster's coming so they can take appropriate measures. That, at, the, at, the, uh, at our level, is a mitigation action. Some of the things you can do as homeowners, business owners, whatever, something as simple as trimming trees around your home. Um, that's one of the things that we tell people a lot of times leading up to hurricane season and then when the storms are coming. If you know you've got a dead limb, go ahead and take care of it now before the storm takes care of it for you. you know, if you've got patio furniture out back, um, most of the damage from storms are not from wind just coming in and you know, we, we think of what well, the wind just came in and just blew the house off the foundation. No, it probably got hit by some flying debris and busted out the windows and busted the whole roof, that kind of thing. So as many of those things as we can take out of the equation, the, the better off we're going to be. Um, and then, again, one of the things that we try to do, you know, we have codes and ordinances that are, you know, inches thick in the books. But some of those, making sure that when we develop a, you know, look at the new ordinances and new codes that we're going to apply to our community, that we incorporate some protective measures. You know, um, you know, probably one of the, it's not building related, but you know, you look at seatbelt laws. That's basically a mitigation effort um, because people were not getting, you know, they were having wrecks and getting injured and getting thrown out of the cars. So the government passed a, put it into the law that now we have to wear our seatbelts because hopefully, you know, by wearing the seatbelt, that's going to lessen the impact of the wreck. So that's kind of an example of how, you know, we can incorporate things to help help mitigate disasters. Preparedness. In mitigation and preparedness, um, you know, they, a lot of times they go hand in hand. So when I said sometimes you're doing more than one, this is a good example. Um, Preparedness is usually in the form of plans or procedures designed to save lives and to minimize damage. So again, we're, you know, we're trying to come up with plans that minimize the damage, which goes back to mitigation. And some of the things that, um, that we do in emergency management, we have a local emergency operations plan that kind of outlines, and it's, it's not a command document, it's, it's kind of outlines our game plan of how we're gonna coordinate and everybody work together when we have a disaster. Um, planning is important because you know, if, if you're just shooting from the hip, things go a lot smoother when you know ahead of time who, who should be doing what. And when you're having to, you know, you're going to be under enough stress if you have the, the best plan in the world and you've got a tornado bear or a hurricane bearing out on you. But if you have no plan at all and you're just kind of leaning, <clears throat> it's probably not going to go so good. The, you're probably going to um, not like the press that comes out as a mitigation plans. Again, we don't just wait until something happens. We already know that, hey, we're prone to flooding. You know, we have, we have tornadoes, hurricanes, tropical storms, those kind of things. So <clears throat> we do it, number one, because it's mandated. But <clears throat> in practice, it's a good idea. Again, let's think of these things and put these things in motion before the disasters happen, instead of always being, trying to be proactive instead of being reactive. Um, standard operating procedures for some of the different departments. Continuity of operations plans. That's a big one. And again, that applies to, to not just to governments, but um, that's one of my goals to push out to local businesses and, and other agencies and organizations is having a plan in place. Um, what are you going to do if something happens and you can't get to your office? You know, um, the power is going to be out for for weeks and you don't have a backup generator. How are you going to make sure that those things that you've got to, got to do? Um, you know, there are some people that, you know, we call their non-essential employees. Yeah, I mean, if, if they're not at the, at the desk answering the phone, the world doesn't stop. 
but payrolls got to be done. Um, you know, there's certain certain functions that the people expect and require of the local government, um, and businesses are a big part of our recovery process. So the quicker we can get businesses back open and get everything somewhat back to normal, um, that that helps with the recovery process just because it makes people it kind of lessen some of their fears and uncertainty and that kind of thing. And then we take those plans and the way we make sure those plans are good and the way we make sure we're ready to respond is we do a lot of training. We do emergency preparedness training and um, you know that's not just for for the firefighters and law enforcement and EMS. That's for the for the community too because like I said the more you can be prepared to take care of yourself the less we have to do. Um, we do disaster drills all the time, um, emergency response training, incident management, and then in this area, we're fortunate that we've got several specialized teams that, that in addition to the, the basic training that everybody does, we have search and rescue teams, um, we have hazardous materials teams, um, rope rescue, all, all those different kind of specialized teams that, um, you know, everybody, everybody can't, um, you know, it would be cost prohibitive for everybody to have the resources to do all these specialized things. So we work together um, in the public safety realm, kind of like y'all come together here as a regional commission, but we develop a lot of regional specialized teams, and, but it takes a lot of training uh, to keep those up, especially since it's one of those things that thankfully we don't, we don't have to use it as often. Hopefully we've done a good job of mitigation and preparedness, so response is not that bad. Um, but response is when something happens and we actually have to take action to save lives and prevent further damage in a disaster or emergency situation. What I do as EMA, and this is probably pretty similar to what all of my counterparts do, um, I'm, again, I'm not in charge of anything. My job is to coordinate and make sure that all the aspects of the plan that we've developed as a team in Lowndes County are taking place to make sure they've got the support they need to take the appropriate actions. Um, we divide our agencies into functional groups. So the fire department is not worried about arresting people. They're not worried about traffic. They, they have certain responsibilities based on their functions as fire department. By the same token, law enforcement, they're not, they're not doing any, they're not worried about putting the fire out or rescuing the cats out of the tree or that kind of stuff. They're just there for support, but they all work together as a team. You know, so a lot of times it might be, okay, the fire department's over here working as red. Um, the law enforcement is making sure nobody runs over and they keep, keep traffic. When local resources are overwhelmed, you know, if you got a hurricane coming in, odds are you know, you're not going, nobody has enough resources to handle everything by herself. Um, so that's where Angel A um, is basically neighbors help the neighbors. You know, if, if I get hit by a tornado and I don't have enough firefighters to respond to all the houses that were, check all the houses that were hit, you know, I may call Brooks County. I may call, you know, Waycross, Homerville. All the counties around us and say, hey, if you've got some help, you know, can you send them? Because they're not affected. Um, if it's something like the floods in 09 where everybody around here is affected, our mutual aid may come from a little further <clears throat> further away. Um, but then, if there's no mutual aid available around this area, then I kind of serve as a liaison between the state. So I can call the state EMA and say, hey, you know, we're, we're overwhelmed out here. We need some, we need some help. Um, and one of, the, one of the biggest ways we determine what help we need, and this is how we begin the recovery process, is doing a damage assessment. Most of the disasters we have, they don't qualify for any federal assistance. They don't, they don't reach that level. Um, but the only way for us to know is to do that damage assessment. That lets us know where the needs are. That lets us know so we can send the resources. Um, number one, to take care of the emergency response needs. But then we need to, you know, when volunteer groups come in and say, hey, what can we do to help? We know where we can send those. And it's important for that to be as just as coordinated as our emergency response. 
because you don't want to get a bunch of people going in somewhere where it's not safe. Um, or, you know, flooding one area with all this help, and then this group over here is kind of left out, left up to their, left on their own. And then the last step, once we kind of get out of that emergency response phase, all the emergency <coughs> issues have been handled, you know, the, the most important thing is let's get the community back to where we were before the disaster. And that's really what um, recovery is, is restoring the community to as, as close to normal, uh, to pre-disaster pre condition as possible. So some of the things we do there, repairing, rebuilding, and replacing property. You know, if stuff is, is damaged, um, you know, obviously we need, we need to put it back. Um, you know, for our local governments, that's our tax base. Um, you know, so we you know, if, if somebody's wiped off the map and they don't rebuild, we lose all that all that revenue. But more importantly, that's that's somebody's life, that's their their home. And so we want to do everything we can to to get them back to home. Um, cleaning up debris. When we had the storms come through January 22nd, that um, you know killed the seven people in. Um, Cook County, and I believe it was, I think it was four in, in Albany. Um, you know, for us in Lowndes County, that was the biggest thing is, and what made it such a challenge is there wasn't a lot of damage to infrastructure, um, wasn't even a lot of property damage. Um, but when you walk out of your house, and you know, you can be thankful that your house was spared, but you know, when somebody called me and said, I had so many trees now, they told me it's going to cost me $20,000 for somebody to, to come cut up all these trees and remove them and, and clean everything up. Well, I don't have $20,000 to sit around waiting to spend on cutting up trees. So we had to get very creative in how we could help get that debris cleaned up. And that's where the relationships and partnerships that we, we develop in times like this come into play and help us get that community back and get it cleaned up. You know, because nobody wants to ride around and see a bunch of trees and limbs and all everywhere in the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> restoring utilities and other vital services. Again, you know, hopefully we've got some of those mitigation steps in, in place, um, but working with the local utility companies, um, because again, once we can, a lot of times, once you get power turned back on, um, you know, that kind of gets people, um, back to normal and, and kind of the way we gauge whether or not you know everybody thinks that okay FEMA's coming in they're bringing you know you see all the pictures of they're handing out ice and water and food and all this well really our goal is you know if we can get the Walmarts and the Publix and Winn-Dixie's and all those different stores open where people have access to get what they need then that means that we don't have to go through all the logistical nightmare of getting all those once the distribution is set up, you know, <clears throat> getting all the, the uh, goods there and then getting them, getting them passed out. And basically our, our number one goal is to, during the recovery process, our first priority is to make sure that people's basic needs, they've got food, water, and shelter. Uh, we want to make sure that they've got, got those needs met and then we can worry about starting the rebuilding process. <clears throat> and then we start it all over again. So. Like I said, we're always in one of these phases. You know, once we once we get done with the response and start the recovery process, you know, we're going to identify things. Okay, what can we do next time that would that would make this less of an impact and make this make this go better? And that may be mitigation. It may be going back to the preparedness phase and updating some of our plans. So that it's a never-ending cycle. We're always in one, but we like to stay in mitigation and preparedness. Not have to deal with response and repair. <clears throat> so with that, that's kind of the end of my presentation. Um, be glad to <clears throat> answer any questions if y'all got a few questions. I got one. Okay. So um, when an event happens in the community, the community itself, and the neighbors, the neighboring communities respond. But um, is it fair to say that it may take two days? Three days to see help from FEMA or, I mean, actual substantial help. We have their support and they're trying to, but should the community be prepared to take care of it? So this, this is how, 
we encourage citizens to be prepared to take care of yourself for up to 72 hours. Now, it typically, that, that's kind of a worst case scenario. Um, but, you know, if you've got a bunch of trees down and, you know, kind of the way we, if we get a bunch of calls and there's no immediate life safety issues in the neighborhood, um, they're just without power, you know, and, and they're kind of inconvenienced. Um, you know, we're going to get to them eventually. We're going to get those roads cleared. But if there's no life safety issues there, but we've got people trapped that need to get medical attention, we're going to devote all our resources over here. So that's why we tell people up to 72 hours. Um, the way the process works is we'll realize pretty quickly within the first 24 hours, you know what, this is more than we can handle at our level, even with mutual aid. So I send the request up to the state. We start following those requests, hey, I need this and this and this and this and this. And then when it starts getting more, the state says, you know what, we ain't got all that. We need some help. Um, we may get some, some response resources like specialized teams and that kind of thing. Um, I would say you're probably 96 hours, four days at best. Um, but as far as you know, my experience has been that to actually get them to come in and start doing damage assessments um, and decide, hey, are we going to get a presidential declaration? Um, I don't think I've been involved in one that we got, we had the feds come in and quicker than a week and a half to two weeks. So, because again, <clears throat> Most of what FEMA and the federal resources do are to assist you with the recovery process. Um, so recovery, um, you know, they're they're not as as proactive on that. They wait for us to. You know, the governor has to send up a request to the FEMA director and all all that. Um, so they're kind of waiting for us. To, so usually our response is long over, and that's why. Um, we try not to rely on the federal government. Um, you know, we try to get partnerships with churches, local nonprofit groups, you know, Red Cross, Salvation Army, those type of organizations. Because you know, if you're sitting there and you're depending on FEMA to come bail you out, um, you know that's that's really not their job. Um, and I mean, they're there for assistance, but they're not our. They're kind of our last line of defense, not one of the first ones. So it takes good question, but it takes a you know, if you're expecting them to be there in three or four days, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Who else has a question? Do you work with coordination with the Veterans Association and things like that? Because I know they're providing training, um, and they have relationship. There is, and the way that we kind of work with them, so if I have, if I had, GEMA, which is the Georgia Emergency Management Agency, they actually have somebody that maintains relationships with all those groups, the, the Latter-day Saints, the Methodists, the Baptists, and all those. So when we have needs, we, we'll call up there and say, um, you know, rather than me calling a local church, um, I'll call up the GEMA and say, hey, I have a need for, for this, and then they'll reach out to whichever. So they may call the Southern Baptists or Great Feet. The Methodists, they're, they're kind of their area that they focus on is going in and tearing stuff out. So if I've got a bunch of people that are sheltered and need feeding, I, I call it a GEMA, that they will reach out at the state level to the to the Georgia Baptist Convention and say, hey, can you send somebody down? And so that's kind of how we, we um, because, because we did have, uh, during the 2009 floods, we had the, um, Georgia Baptist and the Methodists were both coming in with mud out crews and clean up kits and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, we do we do work with them. Not on a day-to-day -day basis, that's kind of coordinated at the state level. That's a good question. I think somebody in the back had a question. Oh, I was just uh, going to make a comment and a question, I guess. So, I knew that the governor has to request the federal <coughs> FEMA. Uh, so you, as an EMA director, request actually put in the quest to GEMA at the Georgia yes. uh, funding and, 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 and then my other question, my question, uh, other question was, 
uh, having worked with these ha uh, hazard mitigation plans, how what is in place to to pretty much update the public on a consistent basis? Because you know we all sleep and we forget things, and and, and it's going to on where their Red Cross operations are at, their shelters, uh, things that are in place that can that they can go to for their own benefit. I mean, is there any update you've done at commission meetings, city council meetings, or whatever on a regular basis to keep the public informed on what on things that they can do? I know we make <coughs> plans, but I mean, you know, you got to keep them informed or they can get. That's right. So first thing I'll address, just to make sure and clarify. So the way the, the whole process works is I, as the emergency management director, when I realize that, hey, this is more than we can handle, um, the, the formal process is the chairman of the Board of Commissioners, um, I will go to him and say, we need to declare a local state of emergency. He signs that. I forward that to GEMA and say, hey, we've declared a local state of emergency because we're overwhelmed, now I need this help. Then when the governor, he may declare a state of emergency, that's not requesting anything from FEMA, but he declared a state of emergency, that frees up any state assets. That doesn't mean the state doesn't give us any money, but if I need dump trucks from DOT, I need DNR rangers, whatever, that frees them up. And then once we provide our damage assessments, all the counties send everything to GEMA. They get with the governor and say, okay, we think we've got enough damage that it's worth asking FEMA to come in and take a look and decide whether they want to give us a declaration. And so that's kind of how that, how that process works. As far as the, you know, I can't, every county and every community does it differently. What we do, because like with our Red Cross shelters, we may not open the same one every time. Um, you know, we had an issue um, during the January storms where, you know, Matthew City Auditorium is one of our shelters. We kind of, that's one of our primary shelters we open. But there was a group that had rented it out for two weeks straight. Well, if we, since we had other options, they already paid their money. We weren't going to keep them out um, and mess up their whole their whole deal. So we went to, to our backups. So it's you know we don't pre advertise where the shelters are, but we have we have um, code red where we can send out a telephone call and everybody that signed up. We put out on websites. We have started using social media, um, and 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 so we try and put it out in several different formats. You know, the, you know, probably anybody reads the newspaper anymore. So we put out a press release, and it, you know, the local BDT and all the local um, television news organizations, they all put it on there. Um, they'll put breaking news on their website. And then we actually are, we have a good relationship with both the city and county public information officers. They'll go to the radio stations and actually talk and get it out. So we try and push it out you push out emergency information out and just saturate everybody with it. So hopefully they've got one of those methods they can get. Yes, ma'am. In response to um, Dan's question, we have the uh, IEMA director, Mark mm -hmm. Osley. We also have code green. Mm -hmm. And then usually everything that happens, you know, he's, it's always on uh, the website, you know, on the computer comes through. So. I think he does a very good job in keeping us alert, you know, in the city about what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Mark's very well thought of uh, throughout the state, so he, you're right, he does do a, a great job. And like I said, most of us do kind of, there are little things about our communities that are different, so there are maybe little things that we do differently, but you know, everybody pretty much you know, has a, it takes a similar approach. We just use every tool at our disposal to make sure we get the information out as much as possible. And you know, as much as technology and things are changed, there'll be something else that comes out. And um, you know, we'll we'll change have to change the way we're we're doing things again to make sure we're we're getting those people. So <clears throat> sorry, I, I think we went a little bit over, but um, I hope y'all enjoyed the presentation and, and got something out of it. If you have any more questions, feel free to come up to me later. And uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions or get my contact information. So if you uh, need anything, you're always welcome to contact me. Thanks. Thank you, Ash. Just appreciate the reminder that we, we don't need to be prepared just for ourselves, but for our
our neighbors as well. Joyce?